are streaming audio live on RTC Channel 5 and soon to be streaming audio and video live on RTC Channel 4. And that's why Scott's in the studio again. Hey, Scott, how you doing? Good morning, Tom. I'm doing well. Good. Hey, congratulations on Saturday night and your volleyball coverage. Thank you very much. Did a nice job. Thank you. Did a nice job. Doc Talk Radio. And if you have a question as we go through the course of the program this morning, give us a call. 574-223-6059. Of course, you can email us. WROI at RTCOL.com, or you could post your question on our Facebook page. And once again, we welcome back to the studio Dr. Eric Seward, who is OBGYN at Woodlawn Hospital. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here. Well, I, I'm happy to be here. Well, right good. early on this sunny, uh, uh, sunny, uh, <laughs> Rainy morning. If, if any of us could have brought decent <laughs> weather with us. Uh, in fact, Greg Dakota should have brought the weather with us, right? Yeah. I, I believe he did. did Last he? time I came in, it was sunny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> we're going to talk about, of course, October being Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we're going to discuss that a little bit this morning, right? Sure. Yeah, okay. I wanted to, to start out today. Um, the themes that I wanted to hit on today were mainly themes of uh, radiology and in imaging okay um and that's why i've got my esteemed guest greg dakota here he's our director at woodlawn of the radiology department but to start off with breast cancer awareness this is still october we're, we're heading down the home stretch here but the reminder uh, goes out that we are recommending people get breast cancer screening uh, starting between ages 35 and 40 as a baseline, and then at least every other year after that, uh, the my governing body, the ACOG, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, recommends yearly after 40. Um, and then there are a number of, of potential follow-ups and other issues. If anybody has a family history of a first-degree relative, a mom, a sister, a daughter, who have had breast cancer, prior to the age of 50. We usually start our screening about 10 years before that. Um, there's some breast cancer uh, genetic testing that can be done in those cases. And uh, these are just things that I would encourage everybody to consult their, their own personal physicians uh, to set up that um, follow through and, uh, and to get those mammograms. Um, I think last time I was in, I told everybody's got a story. I. I told the story of my sister-in-law um, who died at breast, of breast cancer at age 41, was diagnosed at age 38. Um, you know, and like most people, she didn't have, she did have a family history, but not, not a direct family history of breast cancer. Most breast cancers are not genetic, so don't think I can put off that mammogram simply because I don't have a... A family history. Family history is a factor, but it is not the all-encompassing factor necessarily. Yeah, it is not. Um, there's a you know roughly a one in nine or one in ten lifetime risk of breast cancer, regardless of family history. Okay. It goes up from there if you've if you've had family history issues, um, particularly with with younger breast cancers. Okay. Yeah. So with that that in mind, I'm gonna. I'm going to turn the mic over to Greg and let him talk just a little bit about what we've got, what exciting things we have going on in the radiology department. Greg, good morning. <laughs> and nice to have you with us. And of course, you good are morning. the head of radiology at Woodlawn Hospital. Yes. Okay. Yes, I am. Um, as Dr. Seward said, I mean, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so we hit on this, although it is a, a year-long endeavor. Um, I think that's a good point. You know, we, we, we specify October as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, but just like you said, it's, it's a year-long endeavor. So just because we get through the month of October, don't forget about it. Yeah, yeah. Not that we're not appreciative of the publicity sure. and the efforts. Um, it does make a difference. We see that in our volumes, obviously. So, um, But it's something you don't want to forget and brush under the rug. Um, it is very important that you get your mammograms done, that you work with your health care providers, as Dr. Seward said, and look for changes in the breast tissue um, throughout the year and make sure you get those taken care of. I mean, mammogram is still the best screening tool we have. There are other imaging modalities that can help with uh, the care and things we see or don't see in mammograms, um, depending on your risk factors, your breast tissue. Um, so, you know, but screening mammography is still the baseline, the best place to go to start with. And then um, make sure you do those follow-ups, work with your healthcare provider, and don't, don't 
be in denial, I guess I want to say. Okay. Um, it, the earlier you catch it, the better the outcomes. That's proven and, uh, you know, can't stress enough how important it is to make sure you get that done. Okay. With, uh, with my sister-in-law, her diagnosis came from a self-breast exam, and she actually had to convince her providers to kind of go the next step because she was as young as she was. Um, but in, in the end, she was right. Uh, she, she had actually caught a cancer. If I if I haven't seen my doctor this month, but but I'm listening, and I think you know that really is something I need to do is get my mammogram. Do I have to go through my local provider first and foremost, or can I go directly to Dr. Seward or to radiology or whatever? I'll, I'll let our radiology okay. uh, guy answer that question, but I, I will say that you can come through me. Okay. Um, and uh, that one of the interesting things about the field of OBGYN is that we keep one foot firmly in the specialty field and we keep one foot firmly in the primary care field, <laughs> which means that we kind of have that option of seeing people for routine yearly screenings and things like that. And, you know, a good chunk of my practice, I would say at least a quarter, if not a third, are, are those sorts of issues. And so, Yes, by all means. Okay. If if you don't have a doctor out there, or if your doctor isn't isn't on that, um, or real comfortable with that, by all means, get in and we'll we'll get that job done. Now I'll I'll let Greg address the okay. other. Um, yeah, you can get a screening mammogram if you're not having any symptoms, just your regular yearly screening. You can set that up without a doctor's order. Um, we do ask that you have a physician that we can send the results to and that you can discuss and do your follow-ups with. Um, if you are having any signs and symptoms, it's important that you do get in to see your health care provider and let them help you navigate that and make the determination for what imaging may or may not be needed at the time. Um, and that way it helps ensure the follow-ups too. Um, and as Dr. Seward said, it's, it's great to find the provider that you're most comfortable with um, and then work with them, you know, continue with them because it is important to recognize subtle changes throughout. So as they get familiar with you and your history, um, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to start fresh with a new provider, but it's doable. Don't get me wrong, but um, it is important that you and your physician talk, get comfortable with each other and recognize those changes early. That's the whole key to this program. Insurances pretty much cover this? Yeah. Okay. Most insurances cover it. I haven't had a denial for a mammogram okay. I don't, that I can recall. So, um, again, if you're having signs and symptoms, though, it is important to start the process with your health care provider and then go from there. Greg, are mammograms becoming more user-friendly, can we say, <laughs> in terms of the mammogram itself? Um, yes and no. Uh, we have digital technology, which we offer. Um, uh, that makes it a little more, we get a little more detailed image with that technology. Um, it's still the same process as far as the mammogram. It's not a comfortable procedure, although it's not, not horrible, I've been told, but I can't speak from experience, sure. obviously. Um, but uh, there are new technologies that don't make it harder for the patient by any means. However, it gives us a lot more information and the radiologist a lot more information to weed through and look at. Um, and then we're able to see things a little earlier with some of these new technologies if the risk is there, if we have questions because of breast tissue densities and things like that. Okay. So. And, and then, that, that provides me an awesome segue. Well, I was going to say, yeah, go right ahead, because then it comes to you. Yeah. Sure. The, the um, getting into that, and we'll talk real, real briefly about breast cancer itself, but typically uh, standard x-rays have been around for over 100 years. And um, they, you know, this is Madame Curie stuff, you know, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really evolved, but at the same time, it's old technology. And uh, standard mammograms are sort of based on that. Now, in the last, I would say, 15 to 20 years, we've seen an evolution of that with digital mammography, which is a much crisper uh, image. That it's less likely to fail to produce the, the sorts of things that you want to see. Uh, we now have uh, other modalities, in particular with regards to um, Mammograms. We look at MRIs. Sometimes MRIs are just a phenomenon. I mean, looking at MRI images of the breast is 
is amazing. Um, you can find little tumors kind of buried in there that, that just weren't clear on a standard x-ray. Um, very, very expensive technology, and therefore we usually reserve that for the either the cases that we're trying to find something in or, per, or, or perhaps the people that we're really worried about, the, the higher risk uh, people. Exactly. We do ultrasounds. Ultrasounds are a lot of times the um, follow-up form for a, a younger patient, largely because uh, some of the abnormalities that get picked up are benign cysts, and ultrasounds are very good at picking up cysts and cystic changes and, and can differentiate between uh, things that are probably normal versus things that aren't. And ultrasound is, is one of the technologies that that I wanted to talk about a little bit after we're finished with the breast cancer um, stuff. But that's a, a big um, thing that that I think a lot of people out there that have had follow-ups, either they had some small area they couldn't tell or an abnormality, a lot of times got back into the system, either had a digital mammogram or perhaps an MRI. Um, I would also point out that there's a lot of, uh, I, I don't know if I would call it pseudo technology, but um, when I was in uh, New Mexico, for instance, we had a lot of people that would go get thermograms and, and kind of other things that are sort of alternatives or, or build as alternatives. And these things just don't stand the sniff test. Um, you know, you, you can talk these things over with your primary care doctor, but they, they just don't catch the problems that that we need to catch. Yeah. Again, there there's a lot of new technologies coming around, and, you know, it's important to work with your health care provider, obviously. Um, mammography, standard mammography is still the best screening tool or place to start. Um, and then as we see changes or challenges in reviewing those, we may, like Dr. Seward said, order a, a MRI in some cases. Some ca Most cases, the ultrasound of the breast will answer those questions for us. Um, there's some molecular testing depending, again, on your results and what's going on. Um, breast tomosynthesis has started to prove itself in a certain population, patient population, um, uh, you know, where we actually can take the images and, and narrow them down and make slices out of them. Um, so it's all about just navigating and and getting through that exam and answering questions. But the screening mammogram is still the best best tool we have for starting with. Dr. Seward, uh, we've has, uh, seen uh, not too long ago that um, a famous Hollywood star or two have gone ahead with the radical procedure, frankly, of having breasts removed because of the family history and because of the background. Is that a viable option? Is that something that is uh, pretty far out there? I mean, I just, I was curious as to, you know, the potential was there. Yeah, it, it's it's a viable option in the right circumstances. Okay. I, I can't speak to any particular Hollywood star, um, but I, I can, I I don't know about that, and sure, I, I wouldn't sure. dare guess. But they um, call attention to it. That's, they that, do call right, attention to that it. That was the point that I was making, I yeah, guess, yeah. Absolutely, and that's a, and that in and of itself is, is a, a good thing. Now, radical procedures, I guess I wouldn't be in favor of that unless there was a pretty compelling reason to. I think when people have a genetic test that shows, um, you know, a positive risk, and sometimes if you've got... And there, there are different models that you can you can assess risk based on. But if you've got the right family history, the right known genetics, um, you know that sometimes can go up to 50, 60, 70 percent risk. In those cases, then it's just it's a a decision that somebody has to make, and the timing of it is also important. Uh, we like to, you know, breasts are, are sort of built for breastfeeding, and so we like to get through pregnancies if we can. Um, after that, you know, then it, it sort of becomes a conscious decision of risk versus benefit. And that's, they're never simple discussions. There's not a case simple by case. right, wrong, black, white right. switch. This is a, a, a difficult discussion to have with maybe Dr. Tomei. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's uh, one of those things that, that some people do, and, and rightfully um, they do. Listener is curious as to, and either one of you probably can answer this, Anything that is done to treat the density when you find it? Well, there's no treatment for density. You're, you're dense or you're not dense. And, and uh, that, that's, not, that's not talking to somebody's IQ. That's talking to the uh, tissue 
uh, basically density is the uh, thickness of the tissue. Um, and the denser a tissue is, the harder it is to see through. And, and so when you do a, a mammogram um, in, on a dense breast, and this is particularly true basically with younger patients, uh, for the most part, it's it's sometimes hard to pick out um, where the the area of concern might be if there is an area of concern. And th this is another place where some of the other technologies help. You can't change breast density other than than time. You right. know, sometimes right. age will will change it. There are some people that just have denser breasts than others, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. It just poses a challenge with regards to the right imaging. Yeah, that's true. Um, here about two years ago, I believe it's been now, um, we started to be required to um, make comments on breast density and some of that information is included in patients' letters. Again, it's about communication and knowledge for the patient. Um, but it, as Dr. Seward said, it, it, there's nothing you can do to change your breast, des breast density. Sure. Um, but it is something that uh, the radiologists and your physician need to know just so they can help navigate through all these different modalities for imaging and your risks and so forth. So it is a very personal thing that you, you know, need to, again, work with your physician, um, make sure that you get the unique treatment that you need. You ever run into men with breast cancer? Well, I don't because I don't see men, but I, I have run yeah. into women who were who, who were daughters of men who had breast cancer. Okay. And that, that actually is a particularly high risk for BRCA2 type genetic change. And in fact, in that particular patient that I, I recall, she was fairly young. We found a, a lump. We sent her for a, a mammogram and then on for biopsy. And ultimately she had breast cancer, did the genetic testing because her, she had a father with breast cancer. And sure enough, she had the BRCA2, which is textbook. Um, that it, it's not a super common cancer to run into, um, but when it does happen, it's got a really high risk of being a genetic Yeah. Dr. Cancer. Eric Seward, our guest, OBGYN at Woodlawn Hospital, along with Greg Dakota, head of radiology at Woodlawn Hospital. Gentlemen, what else would you like to add this morning? Well, I wanted to uh, go through just a few other uh, items, and these are all imaging type items, okay. and probably to cut to the, the chase. Um, one of the most exciting things in, in obstetrics, of course, is ultrasound. Um, this, this is the one visit that everybody gets fired up for. They come in for that <laughs> ultrasound. And, uh, and we use ultrasound a lot. Ultrasound uh, is different from a few of the other radiologic tests in that it really doesn't use radiation. It sort of works on the premise that if you're in a canyon and you shout, your sound waves bounce off of the other side and come back. We can register that. Well, if you use an, an ultra high frequency, you can you can differentiate between things that bounce back almost completely, like bones, um, versus things that that partially bounce back, like skin and muscle and tissue. And it makes a, a great uh, handheld option for looking at a baby that doesn't always lay still. That doesn't always lay in one plane. Um, you can you can do beautiful images, MRI images of babies, but they're hard to read because babies are curled up in balls and they they point any which direction and they they never set still for long. And so, ultrasound is a, a great way to do that. We um, have now trialed a few different machines, and I've been really impressed. I, I love the 3D technology. Um, my patients love the 3D technology, <laughs> so we, we've uh, done a lot with that. Ultrasound's really, um, it's, it's rare that I'm surprised by uh, too many major birth defects uh, in that we usually know about these things. We, we, I've never been surprised by twins. Um, I, I can't imagine in, in this day and age, um, probably the, the three of us sitting in this room, uh, our, our parents, our mothers probably didn't get ultrasounds. I know mine didn't, um, but it, you can't imagine going through a pregnancy really within the last 20 right. years without having at least one ultrasound. Exactly. That's a, a pretty standard way. We set our dates with early ultrasounding. Um, there are some genetic screening, um, testing uh, protocols that include early ultrasound 
uh, tests. And then, of course, we do our more uh, anatomic uh, ultrasounds, more towards the middle of pregnancy. 3D, everybody comes in and they want to know about the 3D ultrasounds. Well, I love to talk about it. It's, it's a <laughs> lot of fun. Um, you know, people walk out with really neat images. But those are probably the, the prettiest images we make between maybe uh, 25 and 32 weeks at a time when babies have a little um, more... Uh, meat to them but at the same time are still small enough that you've got adequate fluid around you can get good images um but that's you know really exciting stuff in my field and the just since i've been a resident in the last 15 20 years the cost of that technology has come down the the uh, amazingness if you will of it the the options that we have off of ultrasound have gone up uh, some of the things that we can do with that the images we can make i think 3d technology really became a, a mainstream thing maybe in about 2004 2005 and it's just really exploded since then now there are several companies on the market making really good office machines and and i think most of the bigger machines now probably have the ability to do that sure. Um, among other things. I mean, ultrasounds are great tools for cardiologists and, and other um, specialties, but in my field, they're, they're indispensable. We use, we use them partly because of, of where the organs are that we're looking at. It's just difficult sometimes to see those on CAT scans and MRIs, partly because it's a non-radiation uh, test, very safe, proven safe, been, been proven safe for years. And partly because it's, it's something that as a, a provider or as a tech, you can literally move the transducer around uh, to find the baby and, and kind of work through the baby and look at that anatomy. Uh, so one of the, the more pleasant things that I do on a sort of a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, and we're, we're bringing that into the office. Like I said, we've demoed, um, I think, three machines now. Uh, we are... I've been excited by a couple of them, really excited by a couple of them, and um, we've, we're now passing that along up the ladder, but that's something that I hope we have as a, an option in our office here really soon. It'd be great for the patients of Woodlawn, wouldn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and it's got clinical relevance, sure. too. I mean, I, I bug uh, these guys down in, in, <laughs> in radiology. Like, I mean, I, there was one day, I think the first five people I saw, I'm like, send them to radiology. You know, and, uh, and, uh, and they were, I think by the fifth one, they were like, where are we going to put all these people? <laughs> but it, and it's just it happens like that sometimes. But that having that ability in the office to do the little things, to see the heartbeat, or to to measure the baby, or to check the fluid, things like that are are, are really valuable. And you know, when a patient comes into the office and they they're being you know seen for a first pregnancy visit, they they don't want to walk out without having heard a heartbeat or seen sure. the, a baby and. You know, the truth of the matter is up until about 12 weeks or, or plus or minus a little, it's not guaranteed that we're going to hear a heartbeat with a Doppler. And you almost never can hear it prior to 10 weeks. And so, you know, the ultrasound becomes that that way of doing that. And, and so there's there's clinical relevance. Right. There's, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I think, um, you know, it tells us a lot okay. about what we're doing. Dr. Seward, you would be available if somebody had a question. They could call your office, right? We we, we are always available okay. for those calls, and we're always available to sit down and talk. And um, and we're encouraging of people getting in. And, and whether you're coming to see me or, or one of our other excellent providers around the community, we we uh, want people to you know to get in early for prenatal care. We want um, it, we all more or less follow the same. You know guidelines and standards. We all it's a, a relatively small place here. Right. One of the real advantages of that is that we're all elbow to elbow and talking and and discussing things and know each other, share share information right right and left and back and forth. And you know if I have a problem and, and need radiology, all I got to do is like knock on the floor and they're right <laughs> down there. I think and, and uh, it's it's just easy to. Um, you know, it's easy to communicate, sure. and we, we really encourage people to get in. And, Greg, of course, they could always call radiology directly, right? Of course. At sure. any time, uh, we'll either answer the question, find the answer, or direct them to the appropriate personnel to answer Excellent. their questions. And don't forget, you know, just another few days in the month of October, we, you know, want to continue. As Greg said at the start of the show, don't forget breast cancer awareness is a year-long thing. Correct. All right. Dr. Seward, thank you. 
Hey, I appreciate it. Greg, thank you. Thank you.